Think. Act. <laughs> and prosper. You are now tuned into the Money Level Show. Hey everyone, we are back on the Money Level Show with Lobo Tigre, the independent speculator. How are you doing today? Glad to be back on the show with you, Daryl. Yes, yes. Quite a few things to cover. Uh, we we talked at the Rural Symposium and everything, and, and a lot has changed since then. I mean, we, we had a couple of assassination attempts and on the <laughs> presidency. Uh, we, we've, we've had debates and and we've had a lot of a lot of news with uh, nuclear energy as well. So we got we got a lot to get into. Uh, at first, I, I kind of want to share a chart. Uh, well, I do want to share a chart. Let's see. I'm going to share a chart here. Here we're looking at the U-308 um, futures. Uranium is has been flat for some time, uh, for a number of weeks, but the equities are tearing. So I'm looking at chemical here. Equities are tearing. I was looking at the relative strength index, and I know that it was oversold um, leading into um, August. You had the J Japan uh, carry trade, as well as uh, the Fed raising rates and such, and and then it's been rising up again. I've been kind of wondering, like, okay, should I take some profits off the table? Not saying that I'm looking for financial advice, but I've been kind of thinking to myself, should I take some profits off the table if the, the actual commodity is pretty flat, but the the equities are are, are roaring? And I uh, just wanted to get your get your take on that. Obviously, we had the news from Microsoft and Constellation, but just wanted to get your get your uh, your take on that. Sure. Well, it's funny, if we had had this conversation a week ago, you the question would be different. And it was on my most recent interviews, it's like, uh, uranium's not doing anything, so this, and the sentiment in the stocks is terrible. No, but, you know, is, is the uranium done, or is this an opportunity? And how things change in just the space of a week where we've seen these these pops. And it's, it's interesting. In, in the first place, um, you know, uranium has moved this week. As you and I are recording, it's Wednesday the 25th or something like that. And it has moved. We have seen, uh, you know, almost $2 in, in change, which is significant at that level. Uh, so it's not out of the blue. It's still around 80 bucks. So it hasn't been, you know, breaking out to new all-time highs or anything like that. But given how despondent the sector was, and I think there were people that were very fearful that uranium, spot uranium, would go lower. So... I, you, what you're seeing could be something of a relief rally. It could also be a bit of a FOMO, like, oh, it's not going lower. I better buy now before it goes higher again. Um, but the way I am, and I don't, I don't know which way it's going to go, but um, I think an important thing for the audience to keep in mind is you said, oh, it's been around here for a couple of weeks. Well, that level is where the long-term contract price has risen to. So, you know, that was 79, 80 bucks. So 79, 80 bucks is where spot fell to. And that actually makes perfect sense, right? You know, the, the, the two correlate highly and, and spot can run away for a while, but it always converges back to the long-term price. So when spot was falling and people were pulling their hair out and I was saying, this is an opportunity, I'm not worried, I'm looking to buy. People were like, oh, Lobo, you're just a permeable, you know, how do you know it's not going to go down? And of course, I don't know. But I do know that historically, the long-term price, which is what really matters to the industry, has been you know support. And we got to that level, lo and behold, it held. So I'm not surprised by any of this. You know, I was talking myself blue in the face about what an opportunity it was for all the negative sentiment. So hopefully the people that listened are now asking the question, You're, um, should I take some profit here? And my answer would actually be no. I, I, I don't. I, I think this market has a long way to go. I think this particular blip right now, who knows, maybe it corrects next week or whatever. Doesn't matter. It. Um, I think in a way, I'm more fearful of a near-term correction now than I was when it was at 80 or, or, or when it wasn't moving, right? With the stocks moving up, I'm more fearful because I, I don't see an immediate catalyst unless... Because Adam Prom really drops the ball in some bigger, more visible way. The news that they're cutting their their 2025 guidance is already out. That was a catalyst I was looking for last month, and that's out now. So, I, 
I don't see the immediate thing. And, and it could be that the uranium stocks are moving in sympathy with the overall market. You know, China announcing its new stimulus programs and, and the commodity complex writ large, even copper responded to that news. So it could be in a way rising for the wrong reason, if you follow me, which makes me nervous about the near term. But other than the very near term, I'm not nervous at all. And if it does correct, I would look to buy more. Would I look to sell now? No, because I don't know where it'll go next. It could be that I'm wrong, that you know industry insiders have caught on to some trend or some factor that I haven't seen yet, and that it's off to 100 bucks again. I, I don't know which it will be. And uh, so I, I'm just not a day trader, right? I'm not going to you know plot lines on the chart and pop in and out of my positions. I'm a bull on uranium. I think the supply constraints remain serious at a time where the demand case just keeps getting better and better. And so I'm long and I expect to stay long until I see the supply stay in balance. Now, will I take profits along the way? You betcha, right? It, um, or if uh, if a company fails, like it's company specific news, we're going to build this mine and hey, it's not working. Yeah, you know, I'm not going to hold that just because I'm a uranium bull. Uh, but the Sorry, long-winded answer, because I think there's a lot going on in the uranium space. But my general point to your, to your question is, no, I'm not looking to take profits particularly right now at all. If anything, I still see the sector is on sale. I'm looking to buy where I see a compelling value proposition still on the table. Hello, everyone. Excuse the brief interruption in the interview, but I want to tell you about my new newsletter called Money Levels Insights. By subscribing to this free newsletter, you will gain access to premier content, technical trades that I am making, and insights to the macro landscape. Also, I interview a lot of industry experts that provide me information off camera, and I would love to provide you all with some of that information that is given to me. So be sure to click the link in the description so that you can get on the list for this free newsletter that is going to be coming soon. Thank you all for your support. Now, without further ado, let's get back to the interview. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes that makes uh, total sense. Uh, so the um, so we recently had the news with Constellation and Microsoft and Three Mile Island. Um, I was looking at Constellation. Uh, before, because there was a big article about nuclear that came out in Barron's. And then um, I was reading that article and they were mentioning Constellation. So I was looking at it. And then all of a sudden, I just this news just dropped about the Microsoft, uh, I think, purchasing the reactor from them or something of that nature. But we see this trend of data centers and and many of these big um, tech companies that are pushing the AI, uh, uh, pushing AI forward. Uh, they're they're wanting to uh, be in compliance with like ESG and 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 such and so so now they're looking at nuclear. So, uh, what what's your take on on that move and like how that contrib may have contributed to uh, recent price movements? We have a free article on our website right now called "Uranium and AI Play?" Question mark, and our answer to that is yes. Uh, you know the the power demand for this technology, it's on the order. I saw an estimate that the power demand over the next 10 years is on the order of the power demand for the entire country of Japan. I mean, this is just, this is not a marginal or, or, you know, slightly incremental increase. This is a new application, a new use case that dramatically changes the whole um, supply and demand curve here. And bear in mind that this isn't like something that you can just run during peak hours or, or it's not, um, discretionary, like gas for your car, you can decide, well, we don't need to take a trip to grandma's every week, this, you know, every weekend, we can go every other weekend or something like that, right? You can make those choices. For a data center, it's 24-7, 365. It has to always be on, which means windmills or solar are not going to cut it. So as you point out, if you're going to try to be green, you really, there is no choice but nuclear. And I think one of these guys, I don't remember if it was Oracle, which I think is building three nuclear or has plans to build three advanced nuclear reactors, uh, SMRs for their data center. But it was somebody like that was saying, basically, you know, you, the, nuclear is the only option. If, if you're not going to burn oil and gas, right, if you're going to go carbon free and you want a massive data center, nuclear is the only option. So, yeah, I think this is a, a, a 
I don't want to say too much of a game changer. If it plays out as the optimists and as the hype suggests it will, then it's you know a tremendous tailwind for uranium. Now, bear in mind, we don't need this anyway. The demand is already pulling a hockey stick without this. If it does, this just makes that even more so. And why I'm couching my words here is not that I doubt the analysis. It's just nobody knows the future. And it could be that you know NVIDIA gets overtaken by Intel as something in the next lap of the race. If Intel, which is now almost left for dead, comes up with a, an AI chip that uses one one hundredth the energy of the NVIDIA chips or something. You know, I'm, I'm not a technologist. I, I can't predict that. Um, and I just think it's important for anybody that's making long-term bets here to understand the risks between what you do understand. Like I understand the Iranian mining industry fairly well. You know, I don't understand the technology wars and, you know, how the chip wars are going to play out in the future. So that makes me a little bit cautious. But mm. like I say, if it happens, it's a huge tailwind for uranium. If it doesn't, then we're I'm a bull anyway. So, you know, it's kind of a win-win. It's kind of the icing on the cake uh, kind, of, kind of thing. Uh, so... Uh, with but that could be a lot of icing <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> definitely definitely it's like one of those pieces of cake you're like this is that too much frosting on it uh but <laughs> so uh with with this demand uh i mean even just the demand for energy and the how much energy usage ai i mean google searches how much they they take how much energy they use um what would that look like for contracts in 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 uranium in terms of uh securing a supply securing securing the the commodity itself i mean cuz constellation is a i don't think they're a miner they're they're a, a utility company out there right right yeah that's a, that's an interesting question and it's a bit of a a crystal ball question uh you know this is just beginning so it'll be hard to see but i could imagine like right now you know a good long term contract might run 5 years you know, give or take a bit, given the demand and the, you know, the kind of application this is, this is like a, an airport or a hospital or something like that, where you have to have the power all the time. It can't go off for you. You know, it, it, it has to always be there for a long time. It's not going away. So we might see much longer long-term contracts. And, and what's that going to do? If you're, if you're going to secure your power supply or your fuel for your power supply, for a much longer period of time, you know, just inflation alone argues for higher contract levels. So we'll see. But honestly, I, I don't know. I don't think anybody could really answer that right now. Uh, Justin Hewn is more in touch with what's happening moment to moment. He's the uranium insider, right? He's much more in tune with what's happening with the LTC scene than I am on a moment to moment basis. Um, but I, I think that's to be determined. But it, but it is interesting to think about how it could, it could really, uh, you know, price is one thing, but it could actually stabilize the industry, make it less volatile. Because if you have really long, long-term contracts and you have more new customers signing them, um, for the mining companies to be able to have that surety, this is something Rick Rule talks about that you may have heard from him at, at his symposium in Boca, right? The ability for a miner to be able to secure a really long-term contract makes them be able to turn around and go to the bank and say, look, I've got a customer who wants my product for five or 10 years or more. And here's the price they're willing to pay. And it's above the price I need to make money with my mine. You know, that is a that's a kind of business that even a Warren Buffett type conservative rule number one, don't lose money sort of guy could participate. And it's certainly the sort of thing where bankers can run through their spreadsheets and say, well, yeah, you know, if it, you're going to get this much, it costs you this much, then it works. Here's the money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. So uh, it seems like a lot of exciting things with uranium, a lot of possibilities. Obviously, we, we have to uh, do our due diligence and and keep keep our ear ear to the ground on what's happening. Uh, so I, I want to transition to gold. Uh, we have. Okay, sorry, before we go there, you, you rightly mentioned the due diligence. Rising tide doesn't necessarily lift all ships. If something's got a gaping hole in its hull, you know, the tide will stir it around some, but it'll stay on the bottom of the ocean. So you, yes, you can't just throw darts at the board. You do need to look for the companies that actually have something of merit 
And the other thing I always throw in there, and my uranium bug friends hate it when I do this, but it's the responsible thing to do. And that is, of course, this is a speculation that can almost literally melt down on us if there is another nuclear accident. Now, yep. uh, arguably, I think in 70 years, there's only been one really serious nuclear accident. Three Mile Island was not serious. Fukushima was serious, but it was a tsunami that caused the problems. And ultimately, the engineers responded and radiation was not a problem there. But right? it's just Chernobyl. That's actually a pretty good track record for 70 years. And arguably, Chernobyl was more about Soviet stupidity than it was nuclear engineering. But anyway, the point is, you know, if there's a Chernobyl scale event, then uranium's going to tank, our stocks are going to just crater. And that that's just the reality. I don't well, expect sure. this. I don't worry about it. It doesn't keep me up at night. It's a very, very long tail risk, I think. But it is there. And it's the sort of thing that there is no getting out ahead of it. There's no you know, technical analysis that's going to tip you off. You'll wake up in the morning, the headlines will be there, and it'll be too late. So don't don't get into the uranium space if you're not willing to take that risk. If you can understand it, understand how unlikely it is, and accept that as a tail risk, then I think there's a lot of money to be made here. Sorry, I just, you know, I'm so bullish on uranium. I just don't want anybody to feel like they were led down the primrose path here in case something bad does happen. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, I mean, especially some some folks just they they take they take the words, they run with it, then they try to blame somebody for losing money and, and stuff. And so, but if yeah, <laughs> if, uh, if we um if if that were to happen, we we all losing our shirts. So uh, you know, we, we're all in this together. Uh, <laughs> That's true. Right? I put my money where my keyboard is, where my mouth in this case, as we're talking. So if yeah, I'm wrong yeah. about uranium. It will significantly impact my personal net worth. Yep, yep, yep. We we all there. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share a chart of gold. All right. So gold's hanging out in the uh, 2680s uh, today, and uh, I mean it's just been on a tear. I, I had put a uh, I do a little bit of technical analysis, but I put a Fibonacci uh, tool on it and. My target was 2,700, uh, a little over 2,700. Uh, we're approaching that. But, you know, just looking at the the RSI down here, I mean, it was uh, technically overbought and then, you know, came down. It's still overbought territory. But this is a physical commodity. I mean, you got central banks. I don't think central banks really care about. Um, Can you zoom that out to get 2011 in there and see if the RSI got higher? I don't remember that off the top of my head. Yeah, let me see. Uh, let me go ahead and go to the. That'd month. be like a fifteen-year chart. Yeah, I'm going to the monthly chart. Yeah, so, so here we are back in 2011. It was this high. Oh, uh, look at that! It was higher when it was lower. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so that's interesting. I haven't looked at the RSIs. I'm not a TA, so it looks like from those previous peaks, the RSI is high, but it's not at the peak levels that we've seen before on some of the. Uh, big corrections. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and obviously today's, you know, macro. And <laughs> but, but look at that. That's not just a hockey stick. On that scale, it's going vertical. But yes, so yes, what's the is. question? Uh, but yeah, I mean, today, today's macro environment looks a lot different. I mean, central banks are buying a lot and, and there's many other catalysts here. Fiscal deficits are way higher. Uh, national debt's way higher. And, and, uh, and this isn't something that, I mean, from you, your, you and I's conversations before, like this isn't like a, a trade. This is the physical metal. This is insurance. This is like savings. Yes. And, um, but just wanted to get your get your take on what's what's happening with gold. Do you see anything anything new here? Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, yeah. Okay. So if sorry, if you keep the chart there, zoom out a moment because I want to say one more thing. Yeah, just, but that's fine. No, no, that's but that's good. Um, if you look at this as a cup and handle type pattern, like from 2012 and the down the cup and then the handle from 2020, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not a TA, but I, I, if I recall correctly, I've heard TA say that if you get a breakout to the upside from a cup and handle pattern, that the upside on average is like 50% or 60%, something like that. So a breakout to the upside on the handle from 2000, if it's 50%, let's say, that implies a $3,000 peak. And I'm not a TA. I don't know if that's right, but just 
thinking about things that I've heard since you've got the chart there. I, it just it looks like a cup and handle to me. Yeah, it does. Right? So what it, maybe a TA could could say in the comments or whatever what the correct answer is. But whatever a typical cup and handle breakout, like if it goes up instead of down, you know, maybe that's one way to look at this. Another way to look at this is if you look at the peaks, the 1980 peak, and this is ancient history, but it's interesting, you know, we're just playing with the charts. If you look at the 1980 peak at 855, and then you look at the 2011 peak at 1911, basically the, the 2011 peak was twice the 1980 peak. So if you had twice the 2011 peak now, that would imply 3,800 gold. Now, I don't know if we go there without like a serious breakdown in the United States dollar or not. But the reason why I'm bringing this up is because it's things like this, you know, gold, when it goes into a mania, and honestly, as, as vertical as this chart looks, you know, the, the, the hairspray heads on mainstream financial media, sorry, I shouldn't be ad hominem, the respected journalists on mainstream financial media are even just barely beginning to talk about gold and ask about gold. You know, you can't just have all time high after all time high, even if it's just nominal without financial media noticing and saying something. So it's it's not just the occasional guest now, the actual hosts on these shows are starting to say, well, what about gold, right? Because it's just too powerful to ignore. In my view, yeah. that's not a sign of the top. They're just starting. It's They're just, you know, like pulling teeth, just dragging them into the point that where they're, deigning to recognize that it even exists, let alone that it's in a bull market. So I, I, as scary as that chart may look, oh my gosh, it's gone vertical, right? It's got to come back. All the fundamental reasons for it that I can think of are bullish. You know, where the Fed is going to rate loosening cycle. That's bullish. I think we're going deeper into recession. That's bullish. You've got the central banks buying. That's bullish. You've got two hot wars, either of which could become World War III. That's bullish. I mean, there's, I just don't see the fundamental in front of us that says, oh, well, you know, gold needs to go down. Um, so not being a TA, I'm, I'm happy to bet on it going farther up. And I am doing that uh, with my own money. Um, you know, how far? I don't know. I'm. Do I feel nervous about that chart right now? No, not really. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I just... I don't see the trigger. I don't see um, anything that says that, that, never mind the chart, but like in reality, that supply is about to catch up or the demand is going to falter. We're in a scary world right now. It makes sense to me for gold to be ripping. Um, so no, I'm not worried about it. If we get to around 3000, right? You know, if that cup and handle thing or something, you know, th th that's, that's not a price target, but maybe that's a level where I'll start to feel a little bit nervous or more inclined to, uh, take profits as they come. But, you know, who knows how high this thing goes, Daryl? Mm -hmm. Certainly you, not me. Would you ever take profits on on physical or are you are no. you to the equities? No, definitely equities. Uh, so, well, a couple of things, you know, for, for physical, uh, you know, I agree with JP Morgan, gold is money, everything else is credit. When I save, as you were talking about in your question, when I, when I save, I said, I, you know, buy, I don't store... I don't invest. I don't speculate. I save in gold. That's my long-term savings. And so people say, well, how much gold do you want to have? Or you know, what's the ideal allocation? It's like asking me, how much money do you want? What's the ideal amount of money to have? There is no top to that. I want to save as much as I can. And no, I never liquidate that or take profits because it's not an investment. It's savings. Do you, do you take profits on your savings? I don't think so. Right? So that's just not the way I look at it. The stocks are something else. Um, when do I dip into my bullion? Either like some financial catastrophe and meltdown. I have had personally a financial disaster in my life where I sold my coins to feed my family. That has actually happened to me where I dipped into that insurance as it was intended. I've also uh, dipped into bullion to uh, finance a house purchase, right? You know, dip, that's what savings are for. So that's that's when I do that. As far as the stocks go, there's two answers. If I got the feeling that the market really was toppy, um, then yeah, I could see taking more profits or or if the fundamentals shifted in some way, yeah, I could see taking more profits. But I, you never know how these things are going to play out. So I have a, a way of dealing with this that doesn't require me to know, to, or, you know what's going to happen next or to time the top of the market perfectly. 
I call it the upside maximizer. You've probably heard of it. It's another free download on our website on the free reports area. And um, basically it's using a stop loss, a trailing stop loss, but instead of using it to stop a loss because on you know super volatile junior mining stocks, that's difficult to do. It's very counterproductive actually in most cases. But using the, that same mechanism to stop a gain from turning into a loss, you know, having that ratcheting stop loss on a big win prevents that big win from going away. Mm -hmm. So uh, how does that work? You can free, read the free report. But basically, this takes this whole burden off my shoulders. I, you know, I don't know how to tell you when the market's going to top, but I don't have to. If I have an upside maximizer on one of my winning positions, then if it rolls over significantly, not a little normal fluctuation, but it starts moving in a big way, the decision is made for me. I know what to do. And I can prevent that big, big win from slipping through my claws. Yeah, yeah, that's that sounds. It's it's like a risk management tool. Uh, so so instead of, you know, waiting the time to top it and and then it turning over on you, you're actually taking profits along the way. Sounds like, and uh, I'll I'll link that to that in the description too. Uh, so I, I want to share a chart on silver. We got silver sitting at thirty two dollars a share. Uh, we, we haven't, uh, I'm trying to think when's the last time we hit, we haven't hit $32 since uh -huh. back in. Yeah. 32. That's, I mean, it's, it's, oh. it's touched 31 a couple of times, but 32 is a eye opening number. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we haven't been here since 2012. Uh, what's your outlook on silver right now? So silver, you know, I've been called Darth silver for, for not saying silver is the most wonderful thing in the world. I am a bull. My my Darth Silver thesis was never a bear case on silver uh, as a commodity. It was, you know, my view that when, uh, if, when gold goes back into circulation as money, uh, I doubt actually that silver will go back into circulation again because you don't need it anymore to make change. And people aren't going to go around with medieval purses full of gold coins and silver change on their belts. They're going to transfer all this stuff electronically. And you know, blockchain solves that basically. So I just don't see the use case for silver as money in circulation. That doesn't mean it's not a highly valuable and liquid and you know uniform, consistent commodity that meets Aristotle's definitions of money. Uh, I just don't see it going back into circulation. So that's that. Um, but the relevant part of this, though, is that therefore the use case of silver changes. And the increasing industrial aspect of silver is more important now. And you can hate me for saying this if you like and call me other names worse than Darth. But I think if you just look at this chart, I mean, gold is getting nominal, at least all time high after all time high. And silver has yet to recover from its yeah. most recent high. And if you adjust that for inflation, the situation's even worse. And people keep saying, oh, the GSR keeps getting more extreme. This is unrealistic. It can't stay this high. Well, it can if the use case has changed. If the relationship between silver and gold is different now, then we should not expect silver to go back to its historic gold-silver ratio. Um, and you know, people hate it when I say this too, but it's just a fact. It's just a mathematical fact. If you look at a silver and the correlations with gold and copper, silver was more correlated with copper last year than gold. And, you know, okay, they all correlate. So, so it's not a horrible, you know, anti-correlation, but it's just, you know, it, it's part of what I'm saying. The industrial side of silver, you can see it in the math. You can see it on this chart you're showing me. And if you want to ignore it and say, oh, it's manipulated, it's controlled, it should be higher. Well, Maybe you're right. Maybe it should be higher, but it isn't. You know, it is what it is. And if your goal is to defend silver, okay, fine, go ahead. If your goal is to make money, then you can't ignore the facts. You can't ignore this chart. All of that said, this year, silver is acting much more like a monetary metal should. It's been moving with gold on days where copper and oil and other industrial inputs are down. It has responded to geopolitical news. Uh, like the horrific news out of the Middle East with gold, you know, not like copper. Uh, and that's all good. That's great. Uh, so I, I'm, I remain very bullish. I don't have a price target. 
the main takeaway is, and silver bulls hate this, but my main takeaway is I'm I'm as bullish on silver as I am on gold, but I'm more concerned about it in the near term because the industrial aspect can't be ignored. If I'm right about the hard landing ahead and the recession getting worse, then that industrial aspect can weigh on silver going into that situation in a way that it wouldn't on gold. On the other hand, you know, uh, Mr. Market giveth, Mr. Market taketh away. The balance here is that on the other side, coming out of the recession, or once the money helicopters fly and the reflationary boom is rolling out, I actually see more upside in silver than gold because gold is just money, right? It's it's a monetary metal. It's It's just money, whereas silver is money and it's also this industrial metal. And, you know, the new energy paradigm, the green agenda, that's not going away. You, you think that a recession is going to make the powers that be back down from the green agenda? Forget it. They didn't back down during COVID lockdowns. They didn't back down when, you know, uh, Russia invades Ukraine. They're not going to back down just because of a measly recession or even a depression. I think they double down. Um, so that's good for silver, which is absolutely essential for solar panels. And, uh, you know, there's a lot more details we can get into the solar panels and how they're changing or whatever. But but hear what I'm saying. All those people who didn't stop listening when I said <laughs> my Darth Silver thesis, hear what I'm saying. I'm actually more bullish on silver on the other side of the recession because it has two tailwinds where gold only has one. Yeah. 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 Dang. Yeah. So you mean to tell me we're not going to see $300 silver? <laughs> If we do, we will be seeing uh, riots out of our front windows. You know, it's the sort of thing where Doug Casey says, I'd rather see the food riots on my big screen TV than out my front window. You know, a, a world like that, $300 silver, you know, $10,000 gold, whatever. That's a world where the brown stuff is really hitting the fan. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, as much as I want to make money on my gold and silver stocks, I'm not sure that I want to live through that. And I may not get a choice, you know, bad stuff happened. Wars happened, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, that that would be a world of $300 silver is a world where I'll be very worried about a lot of other things besides just my portfolio. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, sure. by the way, sorry. This should be obvious from what we said before, Daryl, but I just want to nail this down on the silver point. I'm not saying because I think silver is more vulnerable ahead of the recession deniers capitulating that I'm selling any silver or getting out of silver stocks. I, you know, bullion, I just basically never sell unless I need it for something. So I'm not destacking. I'm not selling any silver at all. Physical silver, I only add unless I need it for something. The stocks, I'm not selling them either because of this. I'm holding the best silver place that I have. I'm just not as eager to buy or put more money into silver right now until I'm sure how silver's industrial aspect is going to you know, deal with it or hammer it or not when the recession deniers give way and say, oh, you know, it's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, uh, and for those silver bugs out there, you know, I, I understand it's an emotional type topic. This is a sensitive topic for for some folks, uh, but you know, we want to look at this objectively as we and and you know, there's always some counter argument or whatnot. But uh, if you're engaging in the comments, please be respectful. Uh, so let's let's go ahead and talk uh, China. So China um, recently launched a massive uh, stimulus uh, to boost their economy. And I, I hold some Chinese equities and, and I did benefit from that. And so I was kind of wondering, how does this how does this look with uh, commodity usage? Because China is one of the I think the biggest commodity importer. And they um, and so now they're boosting their economy and such. I'm, I'm, I'm imagining that it's going to be good for uh, commodities or whatnot. Um, so I wanted to get your take on that. Sure, I understand the question. And we saw a knee-jerk reaction immediately when, when that was announced, iron ore, copper, we saw an immediate reaction for commodities. But, you know, it, <laughs> you got to understand, you know, that is a speculative move. That is traders responding to the news. So China just announced this. They haven't actually done it yet. Right? <laughs> yeah. So it's not like, oh, China boosted the economy and that sent prices up. China says we're going to. And some people try to front run that. That's a very different thing. And there's it's an open question whether this will work. You know, the, the policy announcements, it's sort of like 
you know, one of the reasons why the U.S. seemed to do so well coming through and out of the COVID lockdowns better than other countries was that the U.S. didn't just use monetary policy. It sent people stimmy checks, like direct, th- you know, thousands of dollars directly to your bank account. And particularly for people on the lower economic runs, this was this was huge. And they spent a lot of it, right? So it made it, it made a big difference in on Main Street, not just on Wall Street. And these policies that China has implemented, I'm not saying they're unimportant or they're not big. As I understand it, it's it's the biggest moves they've done since the COVID lockdowns. Um, but they are, you know, monetary tweaks, not fiscal. So it it may or may not help that much. And there's also the problem of pushing on a string. You know, how does China, the factory of the world, right? This ex, it's an export economy. It imports all these commodities, as you rightly point out, in order to make stuff with them and send them to Walmarts in the US and Mexico and around the world. How do they do that if their main trading partners are going into recession? I mean, just look at the news out of Europe at the same time. You know, the the uh, economic sentiment in is just, you know, it has rolled over in a big way. You know, you could say, oh, it's just Germany's having all these problems, but it's like you know, just Germany. That's like the the economic powerhouse of Europe. That's like saying, oh, my car is fine. It only has a problem with the engine. Right? <laughs> uh, so, you know, how how China has grown. It has internal demand as well now on a scale that it's never seen before, uh, not since the communists took over. Um, but it's not an entirely self-driven internal kind. It's still an exporter. So can anything China does, even if they start sending people stimmy checks, can that really overcome the problems they have as a, as, as a largely exporting economy in a world where Europe is visibly going into reverse? And I think the U.S. is too. They just haven't uh, capitulated yet. So... Yeah, I think there's a problem there. I don't think it goes away easily. I think jumping to the conclusion that China's going to save us again, like they did in 2008, is a huge mistake. Uh, I, I don't think they can do it on their own. Now, if they do this and the US recession deniers capitulate and the money helicopters fly and the ECB, uh, not only the ECB cuts rates more, but Europe and the Germans listen to Mario Draghi and they start, you know, investing more, you know, investing, we call it. If the government starts if putting fiscal stimulus into the economy as well, then yeah, I think we look at a reflationary boom. That's what I would see commodities responding to. It's either a reflationary boom in the near term, or there's fiscal discipline and we work our way through a recession, a painful recession for several years. And carve our way out of a bottom, and then some years from now, it, it comes back again on a healthier basis. I think that plan B of doing it right, right is off the table. I don't think the powers that be in Europe or the United States have any patience for that at all. Uh, you know, voters need to be bribed. So I expect plan A, the money helicopters. And actually, so this is one of those things, kind of like with silver. Hear what I'm saying here. I'm very bearish on copper, oil, any industrial mineral ahead of this recession denier capitulation. But afterwards, I do expect the money helicopters to fly, both fiscal ones and monetary ones. And I think that's going to be spectacularly bullish, not just for the monetary metals, but for all commodities, including the industrial metals like copper and all those others. Mm -hmm. So... uh... And so one thing I'm getting from you is is that many of these countries aren't on the same timeline. So like China, China's been struggling. Like, I mean, their market's been struggling like for the last three, four years, you know, and then this news comes out. And uh, but now you have uh, the U.S. and and these other nations now that they're, they're going into. Well, I mean, they've I guess it depends on how you look at the data. Right. <laughs> but uh, but they haven't capitulated yet. And, and China's right. already going through this. And, and you have Japan in a hiking cycle. So yes, there is a difference here. But but it's broad strokes. And, and you know, I should, we should also say, since you started with the China question, that with China, it's not like they're looking at a recession, at least not officially. 
they're looking at missing their 5% growth target. You know, most other countries, at least OECD countries, they'd love to have 5% growth. But for China, four and a half, that's bad news. They're missing their official target. And of course, you know, what brought them to power was 10% growth rates. Mm -hmm. So it's a big problem for them, even if it looks like it would be a wonderful problem to have from an American perspective. So yeah, there, there are some mismatches here, but but the bigger picture though is still of a slowing global economy. And you know, inflation in Japan is causing them to hike rates or talk about hiking rates, but it doesn't mean that they have a booming economy either. You know, they're they're looking at stagflation. And I think that will echo around the world. So yeah, there are differences, but broadly speaking, I think we in the future, historians will look back and say, yes. The world was in a global recession in 2024. I don't know when they'll peg the start, but they'll say we are in recession. As you and I are speaking now, future historians will say we were in recession, globally speaking. Whether the U.S. gets included now or not, I don't know. But I actually think it would be. You know, the SOM rule getting triggered and, the, you know, the labor market really starting to show signs of distress starting in July. You know, we're in September, you know, in July. So... The, the cracks aren't just appearing, they're widening in the U.S. labor market, which is huge. And I do think that'll be recognized in the future. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. So we, we saw the Fed uh, cut rates by 50 basis points. Um, and I, th I think market estimates were like 25, between 25 and 50. Uh, there was there was some alluding to future rate cuts uh, uh, coming up uh, this year as well. And I just wanted to get you know, your take on, I mean, usually the Fed starts cutting when they see weakness in the economy or they see something on the horizon. Um, yes. They, yeah. So, yeah, it, no, you're, you're exactly right. Which is, which is really interesting. You know, I, you know, I think Powell deserves an Oscar for his performance in his last press conference to be able to deliver a so-called jumbo rate cut, right? A double rate cut and tell everybody with a straight face in that press conference and watching on TV that everything is fine. And, and to somehow pull that off, like nobody laughed when he said that, nobody threw an egg at him or anything. Nobody asked him any hard questions. The outside of that room in the broader world of financial media, you know, people were not, you know, most people, most or certainly mainstream financial media were not calling BS on him. Uh, you know, people like me or Peter Schiff, you know, I don't know what it is about Puerto Rico. Yes, I do, actually. But, uh, you know, there were a few lone wolves out there saying this is nonsense. You don't start with a double rate cut for no reason or because everything is fine. It's simply inconsistent. Like that. It's just, you know, as you say, you know, that when the Fed does something like that, it's for a reason. And it's interesting that as much as the cheerleaders supported Powell in this act, and everybody's talking about how wonderful the economy is and nothing to worry about here. We're just normalizing or making the rates less restrictive. This, um, what's his new buzzword? Recalibration. Yes, we're just recalibrating. But that's nonsense. If we're recalibrating because the neutral rate is much lower now, well, why didn't they go ahead and cut 100 bips or 150? Like the, I forget what their estimate or guesstimate for neutral is. But it's considerably lower than than what they did cut to. So if if that's all it was, oh, we're just going to neutral. Why not just do it all at once? But no, they didn't, because they knew that would cause panic too. I think. So so yeah, it's it's very interesting. I think it's nonsense. If and gold was already up, and for other reasons as well. But gold responded well to that news also. So I think that's gold, i.e., deep pocketed investors around the world, like smart money around the world, they also call BS on this. And it's interesting that as the days go by and as this message kind of sinks in and more data appears, you know, even the mainstream are starting to say, I'm seeing this on, you know, like Yahoo Finance and Bloomberg and that sort of thing, ZNBC, people are starting to say, oh, well, you know, maybe, maybe that 50 points wasn't such good news after all. Maybe they really are more worried than they're saying. So you, you know that there is cause for worry when the cheerleaders, the most supportive uh, media outlets out there are starting to say, mm, you know, maybe there's something here we should think about again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. 
Uh, so uh, with this with this outlook, um, you know, and moving down the line, we got election and such. And as, as we wrap up, I just kind of want to interested in in how are you um, positioning yourself um, for potential correction in the markets or or uh, any any news catalysts of recession and such. Um, I, I mean, for me, I was I was uh, I had a lot more cash back then. Uh, I mean a few months ago. And so I'm, I'm thinking about rebuilding that cash position, but I uh, just wanted to get your take on, on, on your, uh, how you're positioning yourself. Sure. For... Yeah. A couple things, a quick rundown. One would be both of the mainstream candidates. I mean, there is a libertarian out there too, but either who's more likely to win both of their agendas, their promises, they're all highly inflationary. It, it's sort of a, a <laughs> sign of our, through the looking glass world where the Republican is seen as being more inflationary than the Democrat. And, and that's really something for the Democrat that's from the left end, you know, left wing of the party is seen as less inflationary than the Republican. But I got to say, you know, Trump's promises, you know, the things he wants to do, he wants to spend more, give people stuff and cut taxes. You know, I'm, I'm in favor of cutting taxes. I'm not poop putting tax cuts, cut the more, the better. But if you don't cut spending at the same time, you've got a problem. Anyway, they're both inflationary. But the takeaway is both inflationary, which is good for monetary metals. And I think this is another factor for gold. Gold leads inflation. If you correlate gold and CPI, which is a bullshit number, excuse my French, right? but it is. Uh, but you can use it as the most conservative case. Like if you use CPI, you're using the enemy's number, if you will. So if you if you correlate gold and CPI, they don't correlate well at all. But if you look at the charts, you know, gold goes up like in 2020 and then inflation goes up in 22. So it leads. And so that's why the so if that's correct, and, and I think it is, you look back over time, it leads, then gold is telling us we're headed for higher inflation. And and by the way, side point, if that's true while I'm right about the recession, then that stagflation which brings to mind the 70s type thing. And I could, I think we could get, going back to our chart comments at the beginning, we could see that vertical thing get really insane. That's not a promise or prediction, it's a maybe. Anyway, how am I playing this? What I'm saying is, doesn't matter who wins the election for gold and silver, probably doesn't matter for industrial metals or even uranium, both of them are pro uh, uranium these days. So doesn't change that much. It does though, raise the prospect of social instability. I think it doesn't matter which side wins, the election will be contested. You know, how contested? How testy will the contesting be? I don't know. If this turns into something worse than January 6th, um, you know, that would be very bad for civil society. I don't want that to happen, I, you know, but, but it, you know, in that kind of environment, you know, this the safe haven asset aspect of your monetary metals, I think, is there. Uh, now, broader markets you, you, that should be bad for markets, and a recession should be bad for markets. But the Fed has trained investors for years now that bad news is good news. So we could actually see, after some jitters, you know, in more and more unmistakable signs of recession, could have everybody in Wall Street convinced the money helicopters are going to fly, and I think they would be right. You, you could actually see that send the markets even higher. So that's an important takeaway. You know, e even if you're right about the recession, recession and market crash are not the same thing. They can happen together, but they don't always. So I don't know that we're going to have a market crash. We could. I don't know that we're going to have new, you know, market bull to, to go vertical as well. I, I do not know. I do know that in this kind of really chaotic, unstable situation, I'm more inclined to build cash now. And this is something new in my most recent newsletter, my free weekly digest on Saturday, I put this out. This is not a complete game changer, but I am now given the risks on the table in front of us. And as we're getting close to that election now, I am more inclined to build cash. I'm not like selling everything to go to cash entirely. I'm just saying, if I'm thinking, oh, do I want to take this profit or not? Right, you know, probably, yeah, I'll take the profit now. Right. If it's a borderline thing, I want to build cash um, just because that that uncertainty makes me nervous about staying long in these kind of markets. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. 
yeah, we're we're in definitely in uncertain times, uncharted territories, and 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 every everything, right? Uh, so so uh, thanks, Lobo, for coming on to the show. Uh, you all be sure to go check out the Independent Speculator, uh, independentspeculator.com. I will leave the link in the description below, as well as to the free newsletters. And uh, thank you for coming back on the show. Yeah, thank you. Good conversation.